Hey, so welcome to another episode of the Flow Tribe podcast. So this is a special episode for me because we're dealing with a topic that I care a great deal about, which is animal health and welfare. So my guest today is Lorenza Malaguti. Lorenza is a veterinarian and she is the medical director at the McKnight Veterinarian Hospital in Calgary, Alberta. Now, if you don't know Lorenza and you were to suddenly discover her on Instagram, uh, you would probably think that she is an adventure extreme athlete of some kind. She's definitely got a Lara Croft vibe going on. Her pictures are of her kite surfing, spear fishing, uh, climbing the Rocky Mountains with her German Shepherd by her side. And we dive into today in this conversation, we dive into why. Why does she do these extreme things outside of work? And it turns out that a big part of it is helping her find balance and deal with a lot of the stress and the issues she has to deal with at work. So mental health is a big issue in the veterinarian community. In fact, having done some research on my own, I discovered that in 2015, the CDC found that one in six veterinarians had at some point considered suicide. Suicide rates are actually quite high with veterinarians. Mental health issues are high. Stress and anxiety disorders are high. And so we dive into all of that. We dive into the why. Why is that? And guess what? A big part of it has to do with us. It has to do with us people who have pets and who seek out the help of veterinarians, right? Because when we go to these people to help us with our animals, they're dealing with our pain. They're dealing with our stress over and over and over again. And, you know, a lot of people, one big misconception about veterinarians is that they deal with animals. Yes, they work with animals, but they deal with people right? It's the people that they deal with. That's where the problem is. And so if you are someone who has a pet, if you are someone who seeks out the help and the services of veterinarians, I would really appreciate that you take the time to listen to this and to hear the perspective that Lorenza has on all this, because I think it's important. I think that when it comes to mental health, the number one way that we can make a difference is through conversation. And Lorenza talks about some resources that are available to help members of her community, um, but more importantly, as I think as, as a community, as a whole, we need to, to look at both sides of this and, um, not just for this issue, but for mental health issues in general, I think conversation is so important. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Lorenza Malaguti. All right, so let's get started. So Lorenza, thank you so much for being here. And let's just start off by having you introduce yourself and let people know who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, my name is Lorenza Malaguti. I am an emergency veterinarian here in Calgary, Canada. Um, yeah. And so maybe go back a little bit. Where, where does the love, I mean, I think everyone who's in your line of, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people that are in your line of work, it starts with a passion for animals. It starts for a love with a love for animals. Is that something, have you always known you were going to be a vet? Like, was this as a kid, you're like, this is what I'm going to do and you haven't stopped since, or is it something that came on later on or what's the story there? Um, yeah, I was a child and I, I wanted to be a vet. I was out petting cows when I was like barely able to walk in the, in Italy. So, um, and then I kind of wanted to be an astronaut for a period, but my eyesight isn't very good. So better to stick with veterinary medicine. Okay. And what does that journey look like? Um, I mean, we got to know each other at McGill University studying animal biology. And what's interesting is I think a lot of people who go through that program realize like, huh, okay, so becoming a vet, the next steps are actually quite difficult. Vet schools are tough to get into. Uh, I mean, it's pretty much like going to med school, right? So what was your journey like? I'd be curious to know a little bit like how after McGill, um, where did you end up going and how did you get to where you are now. Yeah, sure. I would actually argue that there was a period where I was considering going into human medicine uh, at McGill. Um, I actually had an in and I almost took it, but my love for animals was just, I just had to go with veterinary medicine. Um, I would say veterinary medicine is much harder to get into. Absolutely. Um, Mostly because it's so so limited in positions. Um, For example, in Canada, we only have five veterinary schools and every province you have to go to the one in your province so you can't even go anywhere in Canada if you are for example in Quebec with McGill you have to go to the one in Quebec 
and I kind of wanted to go somewhere else. So I finished McGill and animal biology, and then I decided to go to the Caribbean. I was looking at Europe as well. There's places you can go in Europe. Um, so I decided to go to the Caribbean. I went to St. George University, which is technically an American school. Um, the majority of the students there are um, Americans. Um, the, it's an amazing school. I love it. If I were, were to go back, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, the only caveat is that it's quite expensive. Um, so you have to get loans and, you know, it's a little bit, it's, it's difficult. Um, so I just got so many loans from different places and I was just kind of trying to figure it out and it worked in the end. Um, spent three days in the Caribbean, loved it there, learned so much. And then my last year I went to Cornell University for my final clinical year. Um, absolutely loved it there too. Such an amazing university. Um, and graduated, um, spent a year in Boston doing general practice, um, after which I decided to come back to Canada and I came to Calgary and did an internship in uh, kind of a rotating internship to uh, get better at emergency. So that's what I do now. And so what do you do now? Where are you now? Where have you landed as term? And as far as your career is concerned, what's your position? And then we can maybe dive into some of the more technical stuff. Yeah, so right now, um, so I stayed in where I did my internship. I stayed there for a couple of years um, as an emergency doctor. Then I decided to do my own thing. So I became a locum, so I'm kind of our person, uh, contractor, pretty much. Um, after which I decided to go to McKnight uh, Veterinary Hospital. They gave me the opportunity to become the medical director uh, of this hospital. It's great hospital, great staff, great team. It just needed a bit of guidance uh, with the changes that were happening at the time. Um, so I came in and just kind of um, cleaned up the medicine a little bit, uh, improved the standard of care and all this and taught a lot. I love teaching. So I had a huge opportunity to become more of a teacher and a leader there. And so I, this is what I'm doing still. Um, teaching and kind of growing the practice and, and making sure that we can, you know, have better medicine. So um, that's my goal right now. And that's my job at this time. And yeah. when you say as, as an animal hospital, and you guys are kind of on the border of some pretty wild terrain, I guess, right? Uh, do you guys only deal with domestic animals? Or do you also because I think I've seen some picture with some more of the wildlife that might be coming from the area? Yeah, uh, mostly cats and dogs. We do a lot yeah. of exotics, so rabbits, uh, ferrets, um, birds, geckos, you name it. Um, so we do see a lot of that. And then we have people that bring in wildlife, Canada geese, okay. you yeah. know, random hares that they find, things like that. So we do, we facilitate that with the wildlife, um, not sanctuary, but the wildlife um, group here so that we can kind of help them treat these animals and uh, give them the care they need when they need it. Um, but mostly, mostly small animals, so dog and cat, and then the exotics. Okay, so now that we have a pretty good idea of who you are and uh, the line of work that you do, uh, something that you, I remember, were interviewed for probably a couple of years ago, I think, was talking about the mental health issue that exists in the world of, I guess, veterinarians, animal medicine. And so I would like to dive into that because I think mental health in all aspects of life is a very um, hot topic right now, especially with COVID. I think that more and more people are dealing with mental health issues. I think that we need to constantly be raising the bar when it comes to talking about mental health issues. And so I would like to, you know, first of all, maybe get your ideas on that and then maybe just try to see if there are ways that uh, we can address the issue and maybe offer some solutions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think with veterinary medicine as a whole, um, I can only speak for Canada and maybe a bit in the States. It's a little bit of a different system down there. Um, unfortunately, we are offering medical services um, to people without, for the majority of the part, health insurance. So it becomes a matter of money a lot of the time. And that always causes tension. So now you have, you know, families with patients that a lot of people consider to be part of their family that are acutely sick. And then you have money in the mix and it costs, you know, veterinary medicine costs. Um, and so that makes, always makes some kind of a tension. Um, we have a high suicide rate in, uh, in uh, Canada. Um, for a while we were close to like the dentists. Um, 
and uh, we still kind of do. We have group support and everything between us, but um, it happens quite often. And if it's not just suicide, it's also just mental health, and it does happen quite a bit. Um, and it goes, you know, it's it's a very um, it's something they don't teach you in school, and. In some ways, I think we should start implementing that in schools and just having that discussion because when you come out out of school, you have no idea um, that the majority of your job is communicating with patient, with uh, clients and having these tough conversations and what that does to you as a healthcare provider. Um, a lot of the times, you know, there, it's a complex, it's a multifactorial thing. Um, first of all, sometimes you can't give the animal the care you want because of financial constraints. Um, and then people oftentimes blame you too for you know, not being able to give the care that they need um, and then blame you for being the one that's taking their money. Um, and it's really hard for us to hear that. You know, we're in this not to make money. Unfortunately, the average veterinarian does not make a lot of money. Um, so we're not in it for that. Um, we're in it because we care about animals and to have people tell us that it's, it's extremely hurtful. Eventually it gets to you. And especially if we're talking about emergency, because specifically to emergency, it's a much harsher environment than general practice. Obviously, general practice still has their degree of mental health. I will, you know, for sure say that. But emergency, it's more, you know, acute and it's a different ballgame. But yeah. Um, yeah. So a couple of things there. I remember when we were in school together. Uh, I forget which class it was, but that the, the professor had had a veterinarian come in and actually talk to us a little about, about what to expect should we decide to go into that business. And the first thing she said is you will have a doctor in your name, but you will not get paid the way that doctors are paid. And that, you know, there's a reason why a lot of vets are pushing extra treatments, they're pushing extra vaccines, they're pushing all of these things, because in the end, that's how they pay the rent. In the end, you know, they have the products in the lobby. They have all of these extra things that they're doing because it's not a high paying gig, right? And I think um, another thing you said, and I actually had the opportunity last year or maybe a couple of years ago uh, to work as a vet tech. You know, I took this part-time job in a veterinarian clinic in Brooklyn, New York. And I had, you know, I spent four or five months there. But in those four and five months, I got a behind the scenes look at what it is to be a general practicing vet and exactly what you said it's a people business yes you know every person that comes in is accompanied by the animal that you'll be treating but the care of that animal is completely dependent on what that person can or cannot afford or whether that person you know if they can afford it are they willing to spend that money um and it's tough it's really tough because like you said like a lot of the people come in and they say, before you do anything, I need to know how much this is going to cost, right? And I was lucky. I think the vets I worked with were extremely conscientious of that. Um, they were willing to cut corners when necessary, find ways to make it work. But ultimately, that's what it comes down to. And I think it's also something else I notice sometimes is when there's, you know, the person who may not be willing to let go when it is time to let go. And you kind of absorb all of that, right? Like every, I think it was like when I had to do my first euthanasia, yeah. I was like, holy shit, like this is hard, <laughs> right? Because I'm ingesting, I'm taking in that emotion. I'm, may, I'm at, having gone through it myself with my own pets. I'm suddenly living that experience all over again. And that was once, and then it happens again and again and again, to the point where the first time I had to go bring this dead animal to this freezer and I open the freezer and there's a whole bunch of other ones just lying there. And, and it's just like, wow, what it does to you emotionally. So yeah, I totally get it. I totally get. And so I'd be curious to know one thing that you, um, if anybody were to follow you on Instagram, they would think that you're some sort of adventure seeking um, extreme athlete of mm -hmm. some kind, right? Because it's just like spear fishing and kite surfing and, you know, a picture of you at the top of the Rocky mountains with your dog by your side. And, but what we talked about recently was that that's how you find the balance, right? It's doing those extreme things is what helps you deal with the hard things you have to do at work. So maybe we could touch on that a little bit. I'd be curious to know, like, how'd you get started in that part of your life? 
was it something you've always done? Is it something that you've done more and more as the job got harder and harder? So maybe we could touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, um, I've always been kind of outdoorsy and adventure seeking, I think. Now that you say it, uh, the more and more that the job got harder, now I'm thinking, I'm like, ah, oh, I feel like my sports have become more and more extreme as, uh, as the job got harder. Um, so maybe it is my coping mechanism. It allows me to come back to work and be sane. Um, because the kind of work we do now is most people would not be able to handle it, just put it that way. Um, especially in the demographic we're in and what we do, um, it's a lot. Um, so I think there's something about that being out there, say on a mountain, kiting, that adrenaline, that dissociation, that kind of brings me back to a normal state. Um, I also love it. Why? I can't say. Um, but it makes me feel better. And at the end of the day, I can go back and do my job and be completely normal. Um, so, and you know, funny enough, like now that, and, and vacation too, and traveling, right? And traveling for those sports, that will keep you sane. Um, I felt recently the impact of not traveling um, and not doing these sports because of COVID. And uh, now that I see this is what happens to me when I don't have the ability to travel and go do these sports or do these things, versus when I do, my mental state has been really bad lately really bad and i had to stop and say i have to go because i i need to kind of clear my mind and and um and kind of dissociate from all this so yeah yeah and so what i think people in your industry um and, and other industries as well and especially now during covid i think more and more people need to seek out ways to find that balance ways to deal with their own mental health issues um so in your opinion, not everyone's going to go do the things you do, right? Um, and, and, you know, I teach their own, obviously. But what do you think are ways that people can at least take a step in the right direction when it comes to mental health, when it comes to balance, especially in your industry, where, you know, burnout rates, I'm sure are extremely high. And I can't speak for the veterinarian industry too much. But what I can speak on is the animal rescue um, world. And I think there's a lot of similarities there right? Because it's a fight that you'll never win, right? It's a battle that will constantly feed you more battles. And in the animal rescue world, I just, a good friend of mine was the director for a pretty big dog rescue here in, in Los Angeles. And she just recently, like two weeks ago, decided to leave that position because she said, that's it. I've had enough. This is where I decide that I choose my mental health, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because it got so intense because it's dog after dog after dog. And it's not just the dogs that you have to help. It's facing the terrible humans that are responsible for the dogs that are coming into the care of this organization. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Other than doing the things you do, do you have some ideas on ways that people can try to find some of that balance? Yeah, I think, you know, especially with mental health, um, with uh, when you're when you're not doing these extreme sports and you don't really, you're starting from scratch and you're like, okay, there's something I need to do to dissociate to find my coping mechanisms. Well, try something new, you know, um, you might not want to. Honestly, I've been in the place where you come home and all you want to do is sit on your couch and watch Netflix and eat popcorn um, and cookies and ice cream to make yourself feel better or drink. You know, I've been there um, where you're like, oh, well, if I have a couple of glasses of wine, which become like three or four, I'll feel better. Um, a lot of people go to that. Um, whereas instead, if you force yourself, say, you know what, I'm going to go for a jog. Um, I'm going to force myself. Just do it. It In the moment you don't want to do it, in the moment you don't want to go, or like we river surf here, right? We throw ourselves in a river with surfboards. Just do it. Just pick something, try something new, and you might hate going to do it in the moment, but afterwards you'll be glad you did. And it kind of refreshes your mind in a way that Netflix and alcohol and popcorn will not. Um, so that's kind of what I would say to people. It's find something, even you, you must have had some kind of interest and some people are like, you know, it's not my thing. I prefer to sit at home and do nothing. You must have had something, even if it's knitting, I don't know, some kind of coping mechanism, something that you like to do at home, painting, um, you know, anything. Just go do it and ideally go try something with people, you know, so if you like to paint, I don't know, join an art, art class or a group or something like that, join a knitting club. Um, 
anything that works for you, uh, but get kind of get out, you know, go do something with people or with an organization or a group or even by yourself if you have to. But um, it's I just think sometimes coming home and just sitting at home and sulking and kind of not escaping that um, feeling makes it worse in the long run. That's what I would say. Yeah. And I think what you're also saying is that at some point you have to learn to turn it off. Yeah. right? Because there will always be another sick animal. There will always be another dog that needs saving. There will always be another thing waiting for you. Um, like in your space, I'm sure that if you take a week off, a lot of people in your position would just be thinking about everything that's going wrong while you're away, right? Like all the things, like all the animals that you're not saving. And, and maybe you're good at turning it off because the things that you do require you to do that. And I think there's something to say about the exchange you know, I, I mean, you don't have to take it to the level that you do. But the thing is, is if you're just doing something at home where you're sitting, it's going to be really hard to turn off that thinking machine that's constantly spinning, right? It's getting out of the house. It's doing those activities that require a hundred percent of your focus, because once you do that, there's nothing, there's no focus left to, fo to focus on the other stuff. Right. And that's what you want. You want to be able to have that detachment that allows you to finally take a break and then come at it with a new and you resolve with a new energy and say, okay, I can do this. Let's go back in, but I'm ready for it versus, oh, I don't think I can do this again. Right. Does that make and, sense? Yeah. And finding, honestly, that's a good point you bring up too. Finding that detachment is hard. Um, so I teach a lot of new doctors, new emergency doctors, and I see it a lot in that they don't know how to detach. Um, they come home and they can't, or they can't leave. They can't. And I see them struggle and I try to guide them, you know, in that you need to find a way to detach, especially when you come home, but at the same time still care, right? Because some people can detach completely and not care, which is a coping mechanism, but you need to detach and still care. Um, and that allows you to go into a room with, you know, a grown ass man full of tattoos crying over his little chihuahua that is dying. And there's nothing I'll say that there's a lot of things I don't cry very much uh, anymore, but man, men crying, older men crying gets you. It gets you, especially if it's like a small little animal, right? And you go in there and you're like, oh, I need to be composed. I need to care, but I have to have that wall. And it's, it's such a diff difficult uh, balance to get. Um, so it takes time and it takes some like, you know, taking time to develop that. Uh, it's difficult, but once you do, you can have a life balance with this career and this job. Um, that is sane, keeps you sane, right? Yeah, I never even, I think what you're saying too is this idea of finding a way to, to stay, emo well, to not turn off your emotions, but also you do have to put up some sort of boundary because yeah. again, if you take it all in, if you break down crying every time <laughs> there's bad yeah. news to be delivered, you're not gonna be able to cut it, right? And I'm sure that happens. I'm sure there's people that go into this and realize like, I can't do this. Because it's too much. I, I don't think I could do it. You know, like there were times just as my four months as a vet tech, a couple of times I excused myself and I had to leave the room because I couldn't. I was breaking down because that dog on that table looked like one of my dogs. And it was just like, then the memories start flooding in. And, and that was four months and I was barely there. Like I can't imagine doing this day after day after day after day. And at the same time is if you turn it all off, yeah. Then you just, then that person in that room feels like they're talking to someone who doesn't care. And that's a horrible feeling, you know, and I've had that experience with whether it's a regular doctor or a veterinarian where it's like, they feel too rigid, they feel too closed off. Right. And so you got to find that. And I think the ones that are really good at it are the ones that find that balance. And so other than, um, so what's, I like the advice that you gave about helping people do that but are there tricks to that is there a way or is it something you're just born with you're about to dissociate or to like be able to, to find that balance to be able to like i'm just asking because i think a lot of people and, I, and again it's not just for veterinarians it's also the people who seek out the help of veterinarians right is that if I, I hope also people listening to this understand like hey when you bring your dog to a vet you're i know that it's tough for you but you're also dealing with a human being who has emotions on the other side, right? And so maybe, you know, what are ways that we can kind of maybe improve that relationship so that, you know, veterinarians can have a bit of an easier time because it sounds like a lot of them don't. 
and that people going to these veterinarians can understand that, hey, first of all, they're charging money because they have to, or else they're not going to be able to sustain themselves and sustain their business. But also you're dealing with a human being. Like, is that something that you have some thoughts on or? Yeah. And first of all, on the note of, uh, because you brought that up and I, I forgot to mention, um, a lot of veterinarian nowadays, they, they're owned by corporations a lot. So you are actually paying for services that is then obviously we need to, it's a business. So we need to pay for the business, pay for our, you know, everything we do, our education, everything it has to be paid. It can't be free. Um, but it doesn't go <clears throat> sorry, directly into our pockets. It, it goes to the corporation. And then from there, we get paid. The nurses get paid. You know, it's a business. Just like when you go to the grocery store and you pay for an apple, it's a business. So like everything else. Um, and as for people um, coming in, that, that is actually a big topic. You know, when people come in and, and need to realize that, yeah, first of all, we're human beings. We're not driving Maseratis you know, we don't have Maseratis in the parking lot. Um, also, understand that it's very tough on us, this job. We're trying to figure out what's wrong with your animal, sometimes with very limited diagnostics. So the things we pull and the things we can do are exceptional because we can diagnose cancer with a bare, like an ultrasound. You know, uh, when you compare it to human medicine, they have to do a lot more tests to diagnose cancer. So what we do with bare diagnostics is pretty impressive when you put yourself in our shoes. And then we have to deal with people on a daily, people that are upset and sad, and we have to be there for them. We have to talk to them. How many times do I find myself talking to people about other problems that have nothing to do with their animal, but because they're upset and I feel like I want to be there for them right in that moment. Um, and I always appreciate when people come in and are thankful, truly thankful for everything I've done. Um, and they actually tell you, you have no idea how much this means to me. You're helping my animal and I see that you're putting all of you in there. You know, how many times am I late coming home because I want to stay there and make sure that my patient's taken care of. So I think people should just stop a second, even in their, in their emotions and in the moment of being upset, just take a second and kind of put yourself in our shoes and see that we're trying to help you. We're always trying to help. And even though they're frustrated because it's going to cost a lot of money, your animal is sick it's going to cost money to fix. And it's not necessarily our fault that the animal is sick. We're just trying to help you, right? Because if we weren't there, your animal would get no help. So um, maybe approaching it differently. Um, yeah, I think yeah. like what you said too, is that um, I think my biggest fear, having had many, many, many dogs throughout my life is that moment when you have to go to the emergency vet because that's a very different experience from going to the vet that you go for your shots and you go for the thing, you know what I mean? Like, and the first thing is, is you know that that, that bill is going to run up and it's going to run up really quick. Right. And I, I don't want to get into that part of it um, because I think it's, you know, there's too many variables there to discuss as to why that happens. But in the end, it's almost like that's part of having an animal, yeah. right. Is that, if you, and again, this is a huge part, I think of animal rescue and just, you know, animal, I don't like ownership because I don't think you should own an animal, but animal guardianship rather, um, is if you can't deal with that, if you're not ready to deal with those costs, if you're not willing to deal with that responsibility, then maybe you should consider not having an animal, right? Um, because in the end, I think a lot of people mean well, but, you know, having seen the animal rescue side of things, so many animals get dumped at vets because people can't afford to pay the bill at the end of the day. And then you end up with, you know, dogs and cats and a whole bunch of other animals that just don't have homes. And, you know, and it's a, it's a struggle, but in the end, you know, I think that's where responsibility comes in. It's the same way that you should not have, you know, children, if you're not willing to have, you know, take care of them. Um, so good point. Yeah. And I think, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. By the way, we do have, um, we have ways to deal with that. We have pet insurance nowadays. Like if you don't think you can afford, uh, you know, X amount of money if your pet gets sick, which they will, I can guarantee you, even your two-year-old cat will get sick. Um, you know, get pet insurance. Sure, it's X amount of money a, a month, but it's really not that bad. In the end, if you need to make that emergency trip, it's going to save you money, you know. 
and you have that peace of mind. So that's yeah. What yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's interesting because in the US, I've noticed way more people have pet insurance yeah. um, than in Canada. Like in Montreal, I remember it was, it was a thing, but very few people I knew took advantage of it. As we're here, I'd say more people have it than don't. Oh. Um, and, I, and I don't think the rates are that different as far as veterinarian care. Like what I've seen, it's pretty similar. And so, um, yeah, I think that's great advice. I really think that's great advice. So to finish this off, maybe um, moving forward, actually, actually one thing before we go, one thing I wanted to ask you about is COVID. Uh, I think that that's obviously the hot topic right now. How did it affect your business? And what do you think are ways that it will continue affecting? Um, has it affected your business a great deal? Was it business as usual? Did you guys find ways to kind of mitigate the issue? I'd be curious to know what happened there. So everything I say is usually mostly pertaining to emergency veterinary medicine. Um, so let me just rem remember that. Um, because with, when COVID hit, um, we, first of all, at first I had this fear that we were going to become non-essential and i can't explain how terrified i was and i was ready to like go to the news and say i'm gonna sleep in the hospital so that people can have an emergency hospital open and i wasn't alone there were a whole bunch of other emergency doctors that were like absolutely um <laughs> but we had this moment of are we going to be essential because animals need care in an emergency situation and we're going to be there for them i don't care if i have to sleep at the hospital um so we had that and then we got that figured out and it turned out that we were essential as emergency um emergency as an emergency care but smaller clinics weren't so they were closing they had very reduced hours so we got the overflow and it was hard because a lot of people didn't understand that we had a 12-hour emergency wait because your dog's ear is itchy i'm sorry the dog that came in not breathing will take priority over your dog's ear that's itchy. And people just, I think with COVID and being frustrated and losing their jobs and all this, took it out on us a lot. So my whole staff, I've seen countless emergency vets burnt out, exhausted, losing their minds because people took it out on us so badly at the beginning. And it's still happening. And I find that unfortunate. I can understand why people are frustrated. You know, they've had so much to go through losing jobs and like i said like all, this whole thing about masks and not walking into places and staying away from people takes a social aspect of who we are as a species away from us and i think it's having a lot of mental health issues and then people just are more on edge they're meaner um and we deal a lot with people right um face to face or over the phone and it's it's people being mean on a daily um, as a medical director, I have to take calls from people that are unhappy. And God, it's like our Google reviews, bad ones have skyrocketed. People just need to take it out on us. Um, I call people because they're unhappy. And the, the causes of their unhappiness are not really founded. They just need someone to get angry at. That being said, sometimes they have every right to be upset about something. We can discuss it. But, but it's more and more. And it, it's not like it used to be. And it's taking a huge effect on everybody. So, so. Yeah. yeah and I think that's, been... you know, whether it's hospital workers or, you know, emergency veterinarians or anybody who was deemed essential in the beginning, they're obviously going to deal with the overflow of everything that was non-essential. Right. And I think also what you said is really important is that, you know, you're frustrated as a person because, you know, first of all, maybe you lost your job you're dealing with having to wait an extra six, seven hours. But please remember that there's a human being on the end of your frustrations, right? And smashing your keyboard with a bad review is not in any way. It might make you feel better for a couple minutes for whatever reason. I don't understand it, but okay. Um, but it will have a consequence. It has a real consequence to the people who you're reviewing, right? Okay. Whether it's for financial, go ahead. No, and verbal abuse and physical abuse. One of my colleagues got punched in the face. So it's, it's a lot. Right. I think yeah. mental health goes on both sides in that yeah. sense that, but again, this is, yeah. 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 This is such a tough situation for everyone. Yeah. And, and one thing that I often, that often comes up is there is no, you're, you're both right. 
yeah. right? Like the person who's frustrated because their dog is sick and they can't afford the treatment and COVID is hard and all that. They're right to be frustrated. And on your end, people are burning out because they're dealing with that frustration. You're both right. Yeah. But two rights don't make it, you know, don't make it easy. Right. Yeah. And I think that we need to find ways to almost just accept the fate of what's going on. Right. There is no easy solution. Um, patience is going to be an incredibly important virtue at this point. And I think we're continuing to experience that. Um, you know, I think that, you know, there's some really cool meditation apps out there and I think people need to start taking advantage of that and learn how to breathe and learn how to deal with the fear and the stress and the anger and the frustration that's coming out of these situations. Um, and especially when you're the, this animal that you really care about is, is involved. You know, I know people who are, you know, animal hypochondriacs where every little issue with their dog or their cat and they're running to the vet and, and maybe they're used to that because the vet that they were working with locally is very nice and they're able to do that. But then suddenly that's taken away from them. So now they have to go to this emergency place. And what do you mean I have to wait seven hours, you know, so. It also costs a lot more because we're emergency, and we're Plus, yeah. you know, on top of it. So it's, it's multifactorial. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Lorenza. Thank you so much for taking the time. I think this was awesome. I think that um, I, actually, before we go, is there, do you know of any resources that people in your business can reach out to um, in terms of getting the help that they need or at least some ideas for them? If there are there support groups, are there um, any organizations? Is there anything that you know about? Yeah, so I think it depends who you work for. So some of the bigger corporations have, um, people you can call, talk to, uh, they have mental leaves that you can apply for. So there, there's a lot of support. Um, and even if you're not working for a corporation, like a smaller clinic, I'm sure there's ways. And a lot of the time your benefits have a lot, um, of, you know, you, you can find resources through your benefits to go talk to somebody or seek help. Um, and then for groups, the only one that I really know a lot about is, uh, not one more vet, it's um so this is a facebook group on uh, you know on facebook and you can join it uh it's for vets um and it's just if you have a frustration if you're upset you just post on it and it's no judgment nobody will judge you nobody will say anything you could say whatever you want if you're upset and you need to talk to somebody and get it out it's specifically made so that not one more vet kills themselves so um it's a really nice group very uh, very good for support I think that's so important. And I think peer to peer is probably the best support you can get, right? Because it's people who understand what you're going through. Um, yeah. Okay, great. So I'll make sure to post the link to that in the notes for this episode, because I think it's important that people know that there is help. Yeah. Right. And I'm also going to try to post some links to just some basic, you know, whether it's a meditation app, or I think people underestimate how powerful the simple things are when it comes to finding help, just going for a walk, you know, take 10 minutes and go for a walk around the block, go get some fresh air, go run in the park, go do something hard enough, physical enough, challenging enough that forces your focus to get off of the things that are hard and gives you an opportunity to shift your perspective on things. Right. And on that note, I mean, also the fact that we're starting these conversations, um, about mental health it's people need to, especially, you know, when I'm talking about this, obviously veterinar veterinarians need to know they're not alone. I think a lot of them are starting to realize that you're not alone in feeling like this. And it's great to have a good team with whom you work for that once you have one of these experiences that really take a hit on you, you can go to your team and just unload it and have a discussion with them. And that really makes a difference. And I can say that about my team. We're all on the same page. We can have these discussions. It really helps. So there's a lot of ways to kind of um, get through those moments, especially when it gets hard. And maybe if you are in vet school and you're, you know, getting ready to get into this business, be aware, yeah. come in prepared, you know, start building your adventure sport <laughs> practice early so that you have it ready or whatever, you know, whether it's workouts, you know, I know that the, um, the director, well, the ex-director of animal um, wealth, animal wealth, I forget what her title was, but she was basically the director of the Montreal SPCA. Alana, um, for her, it was CrossFit. You know, if she didn't hit CrossFit workouts four or five times a week, there was no way she could do what she does. She's yeah. like, that's the balance. You know, you got to find that thing that's as hard as your job 
And that's the way that you're able to balance things out or else the job takes over and then you end up in a really bad place. And all that being said, I mean, I make it sound like this is a very dark profession. It's horrible and all this. It's not. It's actually, I would not go back and do it differently. I love this profession. Um, I think it's one of the most beautiful things to see a human being selflessly care about an animal that honestly, animals don't bring anything to us other than unconditional love. So to see an, a person care so much about this fluffy little thing on the table is, I think, one of the most beautiful sides of humanity you can see, especially nowadays when you see horrible things between people. So I think it's a fantastic profession in that regard. Um, but it's not always puppies and rainbows and butterflies. And you just need to be aware of that when you go into it. It's not, but it has a lot of good sides. All right, Lorenzo. So thank you so much for taking the time. I think we touched on some important stuff. I think I'm happy that we did make sure to, you know, make, say that it's not all darkness and horrors and there is a lot of fun and a lot of beauty in what you do. Um, but it's just be prepared, find the balance, be ready for what's coming and make sure to take the time to take care of yourself so that you can then take care of others. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the, uh, the message that I took from it anyway. So thanks a lot. And I uh, look forward to uh, sharing this episode with people. Sounds good. Me too. Thank you so much.